Steve, so we have uh, we have many times in our trust and litigated cases in California where there's a beneficiary or several beneficiaries and a trustee, and that relationship um, is, is usually strained to some extent. Sometimes uh, it's 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 fairly poor, and usually that's because the trustees are very paternalistic with the uh, beneficiaries. That's the first uh, thing we see. But more often than not, we see the trustee simply as an absentee trustee. They're just not on the job. They don't care. It's not their money. And that's why the law, the probate code in California, puts duties on a trustee to make them act in accordance with their own interests. Or otherwise, they wouldn't because you know people just tend to care about their own money more than they care about other people's money. I call it the OPM, the other people's money issue. And so... We have something that's just come out in California that's made some national news that's going to shed some more light on this difficult relationship between trust beneficiaries and trustees and showing what can happen when a trustee who is all powerful simply ignores a beneficiary, even if that beneficiary is one of the most powerful or was one of the most powerful senators uh, in Washington. Senator Dianne Feinstein. She was also a mayor of California for, for 10 years or so back in the 80s. I mean, she was in a very accomplished woman. She's gone through some pretty difficult health issues lately, uh, and her daughter is now acting as her power of attorney. Um, interestingly enough about this case, Keith, um, Dianne Feinstein's daughter, uh, Catherine Feinstein, she used to be the presiding judge in San Francisco County. And so here you've got a case in San Francisco County and you've got a, a filing by Diane Feinstein through her daughter against trustees. And uh, I wanted to walk through this case with you and get your insights as we go through the complaint uh, or the petition. Here is uh, Senator Feinstein. Um, she obviously is going through a tough time right now. She's 90 years uh, old. Um, and she's got some dementia and Alzheimer's kicking in. This is the kind of things we see in many of these cases. And uh, now she's got trustees that are simply, according to her lawyers, uh, not responding to her, refusing to give her information, re refusing to give her mandatory distributions. Uh, here's the attorney that's representing uh, Senator Feinstein and her daughter, Catherine Feinstein. Uh, he's quite an accomplished lawyer in California law. We know him well. His name is John Hartog. Um, he's uh, been practicing for you know quite some time. Looks like he was admitted in 1979. Um, he, uh, Mr. Hartog, uh, he's the main editor of the Matthew Bender publication, California Trust Litigation. And I believe he also has a couple other uh, California wills and trusts that he works on on an annual basis. And so this guy knows what he's doing. He knows probate law. He knows California law. He's an accomplished trial attorney. So when he files this petition that we're just about to look at, um, he is uh, quite an accomplished individual. Here is Catherine Feinstein, also a very accomplished uh, individual. She's a native San Franciscan, just like her mother was. Um, and just interestingly, she was a judge at the Superior Court. She was presiding judge in San Francisco for a couple of years. And now she's currently the commissioner uh, of the uh, Fire Commission in San Francisco. The attorney represented the trustees. Uh, Keith, you and I have gone against uh, Mr. Bracini a time to, uh, again, a very accomplished attorney. He's at Shepard Mullen, a uh, sharp guy. Uh, he's He takes no prisoners. He fights hard. And he's representing the trustees. And he's come out in the press, uh, New York Times, a few other publications, and had a very strong statement uh, that his clients had done nothing wrong. And of course, uh, Mr. Buccini and his clients have not even filed a response to the petition that we're going to look at just in a minute. And uh, so we have to give them the opportunity to file their opposition. So maybe we can hear the rest of the story. And finally, we see decedent uh, Richard Bloom. And this was Senator Feinstein's uh, husband who passed away about 18 months ago. And uh, obviously very wealthy. I believe he has three daughters of his own. Uh, and so I think they stand to inherit anything that's left after Senator Feinstein is done with the trust, but I'm going to let you get into all of those details. So let me just quickly move my screen over to the petition that we've been talking about. And I think you'll be able to see it here. So uh, this is a petition. And just, just quickly, I want to point out that um, 
you know, this is uh, filed in uh, filed on August 8, 2023 in San Francisco County. It's uh, been assigned to Department 204. And the first hearing date is October 11, 2023. So we'll be looking forward to uh, what will happen at that first hearing. Generally, not a whole lot happens. But Keith, can you just tell us by looking at this caption page here, uh, you know, what's what's going on with this petition that uh, Diane Feinstein's daughter has filed against the trustees of the Richard Bloom Trust. Yeah, and these are pretty standard claims for this type of case, although there's a lot going on here. I mean, on, you're not necessarily going to have eight different claims in a case like this, but you can uh, usually have some mixture of these eight. So they want to compel an accounting. So they want the trustees to provide a trust accounting to them so they can find out what's going on with all the financial issues inside of the trust, which is a, a reasonable thing to request, especially after 18 months. Uh, they wanna instruct the trustee to fund the marital trust. So that's what we call a petition for instructions where you ask the court to order the trustee to take an action. Uh, they're suing for breach of trust. So, so supposedly uh, to get some damages and we can talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, number four, to set aside acts of the trustees. So I don't know what acts they want the uh, set aside, but the court has the power to undo actions of the trustee if it feels like it needs to. Number five is to disgorge and reduce trustees' compensation. So one of the remedies for a breach of trust is to have the trustees uh, not be paid, essentially. So number five is really just they don't want the trustees to be paid. Uh, number six is to suspend and remove the trustee. So you see that a lot. Those are very difficult claims, but I'm not surprised to see something like that here. They, they're trying to remove the trustees. And then financial elder abuse against Senator Feinstein. And we can get into that as well. Uh, but that's number seven. And then number eight, eight, they want to prohibit the trustee from using the trust funds to defend against the case. And so that is, that's pr they pretty much thrown everything at uh, the trustees that they can here. And so it's a very hefty uh, lawsuit, very hefty petition. Okay. And when you said for financial elder abuse against uh, Senator Feinstein, that's that's really against the trustees. Uh, what the allegation is, is that the trustees are uh, involved in elder abuse against Diane Feinstein because they're not following the terms of her late husband's trust. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And one of the things that the financial elder abuse statute says is that you can be guilty of financial elder abuse for withholding monies from an elder, not just taking them from an elder. And so this is more of a withholding case. And so that's why they're bringing that claim. So it's a wrongful uh, withholding, and that would be an intentional act, right? This is not, you don't accidentally financially elder abuse somebody. Yeah, it has to be intentional. And I don't know how that claim here is going to play out, but essentially what the claim is anyway, is that they're saying that the trustees are intentionally withholding money from Senator Weinstein. And because the Senator is over age 65, she qualifies for the financial elder abuse statute. And so they at least have enough to make the allegations and state the claim, whether or not it, it wins, you know, that remains to be seen. Okay. Before we get into the body of the petition, um, what I thought I would do here is pull up the trust. In, in many of these cases, we have what we call blended families. And yeah. so Senator Feinstein comes with a daughter to this marriage. And Mr. Bloom came to this marriage with three daughters. And so then there's a, a marriage. And it's I think it was in the 80s, uh, early 80s, they got married. So they were together quite some time, obviously, when he passed away 18 months ago. So how did Mr. Bloom, who was very wealthy, construct this trust to make sure he could benefit his wife, if he if he died before her, he pre predeceased her. But also, he wants he's torn because he wants to benefit his children, his children from his previous marriage. He doesn't want them left on the side of the street. So, what did he do here? Yeah, and that the, that's always the question in these cases: Should I give my assets to this my spouse, or should I give it to my children? And the answer is, well, why don't you do both? And so that's where this marital trust comes into play. And so what happens is. A portion of the assets are sliced off, they're put into a marital trust, and they're held there. And the surviving spouse is entitled to all, typically, this one's a little different, but typically what you see is the surviving spouse is entitled to all the income off that money. So if you were to put $5 million into a marital trust, and you were to invest that to generate income, it's going to generate maybe 4 to 5% of income every year. And so let's say it generates $250,000 worth of income every year. That two fifty dollars goes to the surviving spouse. She gets that every year for her support. And then once the surviving spouse passes away, 
then whatever's left in the trust goes to the children. So it's a pool me, of money me, that's held to benefit the surviving spouse during her lifetime and then passes to the kids. And so for this particular trust, then you said there was something special about this marital trust. What, what when, when Mr. Bloom passed away, what was supposed to happen? And by the way, it might have happened. We don't know. Mr. Bracini has not responded to the allegations made by Senator Feinstein through her daughter. Uh, but let's just you know, if under this trust, you're reading it as a judge, you're looking at this, what was supposed to happen after Mr. Bloom passed away? Apparently, $5 million was supposed to go into a trust, a marital trust that was going to be held for uh, Senator Feinstein's benefit. And then uh, she's supposed to get all the income off of that, which is normal in order to. So what happens is when you create a marital trust, it qualifies for what we call the marital deduction for state tax purposes. So none of that money is taxed under our estate tax system because it all went to a surviving spouse. But the caveat is you can't set aside money for a surviving spouse and get the marital deduction unless you give the spouse at, at a minimum all of the income off that money. So you must give the surviving spouse all of the income and this trust does that. So the 5 million set aside and she's allowed to get all of the income. Okay, that's that's normal so far. The thing that's a little unique about this is it says that if she doesn't get at least $1.5 million of income, then the trustees can distribute principal to make up the $1.5 million. Well, you know, if you think about it, uh, for a $5 million pot of assets to generate $1.5 million of income, it would have to generate 30% returns of income every year, which is highly unrealistic. And so what that tells me is the whole plan here was to essentially give Senator Feinstein $1.5 million a year until the trust is exhausted because it's going to be exhausted. Eventually, because it's not generating enough income, they're going to keep eroding principal. Well, when you take if you have one if you have five million dollars and you take one point five million away from that, now you only have three point five million. It's going to generate even less income, which means next year you're going to have to take more. And next year you're going to have to take more. So probably in the course of what four years, this this five million is going to be gone based on these trust document and what's required. And you have to think that that must have been the intent. So the intent must have been, I want to give my spouse 1.5 million a year until the trust is exhausted, because that's the way this is going to go down, I think. So we're at the petition again, and you went through the causes of action, and you know maybe 30 seconds each, a little further development um, of these causes of action. So the first claim is to compel the trustees to account like you said, this is a typical claim that comes in. It's being made at 18 months post-death. Is this a claim that has some validity to it? Yeah, it does. And so typically you have to wait at least six months, preferably a year before you're going to get an accounting. Uh, this is 18 months. So I think you're well within, you know, well past the time when you're entitled to an accounting. And so this is a, a reasonable request. I think this is going to be granted by the court. It's pretty routine, to be honest. And they should be able to compel the trustee to do a proper accounting and provide that to uh, Senator Feinstein's counsel so that they can review it. Yeah, and one of the one of the interesting things or, or quirks of California law is is that you have this sixty day requirement under the probate code where you have to try to resolve this informally with the other side. And so here, Senator Feinstein, through her daughter, uh, reaches out to the trustees and says, "Hey, can you provide me an accounting? It's been eighteen months." Uh, my allegation is you're not even responding to me. You haven't shared any information with me. You haven't made any required distributions to me. So can you share me with me some information in an accounting? And they said that they made that uh, report on June 8, 2023. And if you look, the petition itself was filed exactly two months later. So obviously they didn't hear anything back. And they went ahead and said, in fact, they even say that when they asked for this information, they failed to provide the request they the trustees failed to provide the requested information so uh they met the 60-day requirement and they filed for an accounting and i agree with you that because of 18 months passing um uh, steve Bracini and his clients have some work to do some transparency to do to show that number one the trust was funded in accordance with the trust terms that's a question that needs to be resolved and then if it was funded you know how has it been managed for the last 18 months how has it been uh, invested and so forth and then what about the distributions that are required under the trust terms? If they haven't been made, what's the reason? And there's got to be a reason for that, which 
I can't think of a good reason for it, but there, there may be. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, yeah, there has to be a reason for why it wasn't done. And it, there could be reasons. I mean, there could be complications in the assets, complications in the estate. Uh, maybe assets have to be sold. Maybe there's an estate tax return they're working on. I mean, there are reasons why some estates take longer than others. But the other interesting thing, too, is that an, an attorney like Steve Puccini, with his uh, expertise, he's going to probably agree to account. I mean, he wants to account. And the reason why the trustees want to account is that once you get that accounting out there, then the statute of limitations starts to run. And if you can get the court to approve your accounting, now you're golden because nobody can complain about anything that was reported in the accounting once it's approved by the court. Let's move to the next one. And uh, you called this a, a petition for instructions. And so let me just highlight this and call this out real quickly. So this is, uh, this is obviously uh, Senator Feinstein asking the court to order the trustees to fund her the, the marital trust so that she can start getting distributions out of this. And just in a nutshell, what's this all about? Yeah, and if you can highlight paragraph 48 there. All right. So there you have it. So probate code section 17200 subdivision B6, it authorizes a beneficiary to petition the court to instruct a trustee. So what you want in this situation is you want the court to order the trustee and you can ask the court to order the trustee to take an action or to not take an action, some action that you think would be harmful. So here, they want the court to order the trustee to put $5 million in the marital trust. In other words, let's get on with it. Let's find $5 million of assets and let's put it in the trust. And it doesn't have to be cash, by the way, it could be in kind. So if you have stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever, uh, it's not that hard to just slice off $5 million of stocks, bonds, and you know maybe a house, whatever it is, and just transfer it into the marital trust. Because once it's in the marital trust, now we have a baseline and we have a set of assets that should be generating some income that should be going out to Senator Feinstein. And probably what's happening behind the scenes that, that you're not seeing here is probably the trustees are saying, well, we can't make distributions out of the marital trust to Senator Feinstein because we there's no assets there yet because we're working on some you know, issue on the overall trust administration. And so what they need is they need the marital trust to be funded so they can start um, forcing distributions out of that trust. So that's why you're seeing this instruction. Let's move on to the next cause of action. Let me go ahead and grab that for everybody to see. This is the third cause of action. And uh, let's talk uh, just briefly uh, about breach of trust. I mean, what's what's going on here? What are they? What is Senator Feinstein threatening the trustees with? Damages. And so essentially what they're saying is that uh, it's personal surcharge. So the one of the remedies for breach of trust is the court has the right, if it wants to, to force the trustees to pay out of their own pocket for any damages that the trust has incurred. Now, I want to be very careful here because sometimes people think, well, can I sue the trustee for things like pain and suffering because they've put me through a lot? Or, you know, the fact that I lost the opportunity to buy a house because I didn't have the distribution from the trust or things like that. You're not allowed any of those damages. So this is not personal injury. We do not have pain and suffering damages. We don't have lost opportunity damages by and large. But we, what we do have is that if the trustees have done something where it devalued the trust or it prevented a distribution that otherwise should have occurred and it can't be fixed for some reason, then the court can force the trustees to pay money out of their own pocket. As of right now, I'm not really seeing what the damages would be here because if the issue is, well, you didn't put money into the marital trust, well, you can fix that by putting $5 million into the marital trust. I don't see how they would necessarily get damages against the trustees for that. Um, and if you're saying, well, Ms. Fein uh, Diane Feinstein lost out on income for 18 months, well, you can fix that just by taking income out of the main trust and allocating it to the marital trust. And so, again, that would be something that could be fixed within the trust assets and would not necessarily need the trustees to pay money out of their own pocket. So I'm not seeing a whole lot here. But again, these are just allegations that people have to do depositions, discovery you know, find evidence. So this could be developed further as they move on with the case. But as of right now, it's, it doesn't look like one of their strongest claims. Yeah. And I, I did see some fact or allegation that was made that 
one of the trustees tried to get involved with another trust that they're not a trustee of and preclude distributions to certain assets that, that potentially would have benefited Diane Feinstein. Uh, at least that's how I understood it when I read it. So there's some issues out there. There may be some bad blood here. Uh, if there is no bad blood, I agree with your assessment. You know, this can all be remedied and fixed. All right, let's move on to the next one. And that would be the fourth cause of action. And here, um, we just want to set aside, let me just pull the, let me re, let me re-pull that out because I want to pull the whole paragraph out so we can take a look. It, it, it's, it's kind of a general allegation, but you can see what they're getting now. What, what, what are they trying to do here? Yeah, so they want to set aside acts of the trustee. So to the extent the trustee improperly funded against gifts, contrary to the sequence of Section 4, um, they want those gifts set aside or order that those assets be returned. Um so I don't know exactly what assets they're talking about. Maybe there was a particular asset that they felt should have gone into the marital trust. But to be honest, if the marital trust is what we call a pecuniary gift, which is which it is, which pecuniary just means a set amount, they, that set amount can be funded at the discretion of the trustees with cash, stock, bonds, real estate, whatever the trustee chooses to do. You know, when, when we have included claims like this in our petitions, Keith, there's maybe one or two paragraphs. I think we're just making sure we're covering our bases and making sure that we've included all claims uh, so that we don't, we don't have to amend or do a supplement to the petition. Um, let's look at the fifth claim. And here uh, they want, they're coming after the pocketbook, as you say, they want to disgorge the, the right for the trustees to be compensated. And generally trustees, uh, you know, as a general rule of thumb, one to one and a half percent of the corpus of the trust is the, the fee that a professional trustee can take. It's not an insignificant amount on an estate this large. And so they're coming after them. And, you know, again, you're seeing very general allegations here at paragraph 65. They've committed numerous breaches of, of fiduciary duties. And then they give just a laundry list of failing to report, account, fund, uh, make distributions to Senator Feinstein, and uh, uh, on information and belief, funding gifts to Bloom's daughters and forgiving. So that may be a little bit more about the Fourth Amendment. It sounds like there may be some, uh, you know, favor being paid, according to Senator Feinstein, uh, favor being paid to the Bloom daughters uh, at the expense of Senator Feinstein. Again, all of that will get worked out in discovery, depositions, written discovery, and then ultimately, if required, at trial. So let's move on to the sixth claim. Um, this is always interesting for me to see and of course, we do the same thing. Uh, we ask for both suspension and removal of a trustee. What's the distinction there? What are we trying to do when we're bringing this claim against bad trustees? So trustee removal is, can, those types of cases can be long and arduous because you have to compile all of the admissible evidence and ultimately you have to go to trial in, in order for a judge to remove a trustee. And that can take a long time. I mean, court systems right now are really backed up. So for you to get to trial, you're looking at probably two to three years. But what the court has the power to do under the probate code is they have the right to temporarily suspend a trustee pending a removal trial and appoint a temporary trustee to take over while the case is pending. Now, that doesn't happen that often. You think that maybe a court would do that more often than not. And yet, Really, it's the opposite that's true. It, it's rare that a court will suspend a trustee. Uh, uh, you know, we've done it. You and I have done it in cases from time to time. But judges are very reluctant to shoot from the hip, as we say. And so they don't necessarily want to sus suspend somebody unless there's going to be some immediate financial harm. So the 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 best case I ever had for suspension is where somebody was collecting a substantial amount of rents but they weren't paying the mortgages on the properties and the mortgage, the house and the properties were about to fall into foreclosure. And if we didn't get somebody in there to pay these mortgages, the whole estate would have lost millions of dollars. That's a perfect suspension case where you're going to suffer some immediate irreparable harm if you don't get a new trustee in there. But on a case like this where, well, you're not funding the marital trust and you have the assets, but you're not doing it. That is not typically the type of case where a judge thinks that there's immediate harm. Even though you may think there's immediate harm, the, the judge probably wouldn't. But the court does have the power to temporarily suspend a trustee pending removal. And that's what they're asking for here. And then they're also asking for the permanent removal, but that would only come after discovery and the case goes to trial. And so that will be probably two to three years down the road if they pursue that. Um, 
obviously they're bringing this claim of suspension and removal to try and you know uh, fire a shot over the bow of the trustees and and get their attention and say hey if you're not going to do the right thing here then we're going to seek your removal and we'll get some people in here who will do this correctly and so I'm not surprised to see that claim in this petition I would have brought the same claim in a petition like this probably uh, and I think you would too but it's not something that's going to happen right away. I don't know if it's just our current caseload, but over the last few years, I've seen courts more open to suspending trustees. Um, and that's a good thing because previously you just didn't get it unless you could really show that money is is being you know uh, taken away, stolen, uh, not managed properly, and even not managed properly. If they're a benefit, if the trustee is also a beneficiary of the trust. The court says, well, we can take it out of their share at the end if we need to. I do like to see the judges are a bit more open, at least in the, in, in the cases we're handling, they're a bit more open to suspension. And I think it would make trustees behave a little better if that precedent was out there. So the next claim is it's near and dear to my heart. And uh, that's a claim for financial elder abuse. And, and the reason I think this is such a, a neat claim to include is is the remedies, but also because you can demand a jury trial on this particular claim. Now, I might have missed it, Keith, but I didn't see in this petition a demand for a jury trial on this civil cause of action for financial elder abuse. I don't know if that is letting you know from a temperature standpoint how strong or weak the claim is, according to uh, Senator Feinstein's lawyer. Maybe you know it's coming as the seventh cause of action, uh, um, but. Uh, this is a nice claim to bring under the right circumstances, and there's some requirements to bring this claim. Uh, the, the person that, that was financially elder abused has to be 65 years or older. That's one of the elements, and there has to be some type of intentional bad act, a wrongful taking, uh, wrongful withholding of distributions, and so forth. So it, you know, this claim may fit here, and it's, it's not in bad faith to bring this particular type of, of claim because discovery is going to uh, hopefully flesh out what facts, what witnesses there are, perhaps what documents there are that would support this claim. But what are your thoughts about the financial elder abuse claim in this particular matter? The thing about these claims is that under the financial elder abuse statute, you're entitled to things like attorney's fees, double damages, and you could even get so far as to um, maybe disinherit somebody if you can prove bad faith. Now, that rarely happens. It, it rarely gets that far, but it's still a great claim to make when you have somebody in Feinstein's position. And think about it. What if this was an elder who's a surviving spouse who has no other means to support herself and the trustees are keeping money away from her for 18 months and she literally can't eat, can't buy medicine, can't buy clothes, can't buy shoes. I mean, that would be a horrible situation. Now, Senator Feinstein's not, you know, destitute without this money, but a lot of people are, a lot of surviving spouses are. And so you can imagine that a bad trustee who keeps money from a surviving spouse, that can be very harmful to some, some of these uh, surviving uh, uh, people who depend on that money for their general welfare and care day to day. So it's a good claim to bring. It's a heavy, you know, it's a big club, and I think that's why they're bringing it. And the allegations fit here. Whether or not they prevail, you know, that remains to be seen, but they certainly have enough to at least make the allegations. Um, okay, so let's move back to the petition, and we have an eighth claim for relief. And boy, this is a good one if we can get a judge to order it, because what happens if a trustee has unlimited use of trust funds to fund the litigation against the beneficiary who's saying there's a breach of trust? You're not following the terms of the trust. And now to add insult to injury, the trustee charges the beneficiary out of the trust for legal fees. Yeah. And this is one of the biggest problems in this area of litigation is that the trustees have access to the trust funds and the beneficiaries do not. And so can the trustees use trust money to defend themselves? And the answer is maybe. But the answer also is you you might as well just face it. The trustees will use trust monies to the to defend themselves in the beginning. It happens in every single case. Until the court orders them otherwise, they are going to use the trust money to defend themselves. So they have a, a war chest, a pile of money that they can use, and you don't. And that puts the beneficiaries at a significant disadvantage. And it, But it happens in every case. You're not alone, but it happens in every case. So what they're trying to do and what the law says is, 
if the trustee is using trust money solely to defend their own personal liability, then in theory, they're not supposed to use trust money to do that. But if the trustee is using trust funds to defend the trust as a whole and the sanctity of the trust and the trust language, then they are allowed to do that. Okay, well, only a judge gets to decide that. So it doesn't matter what I think. You know, I can think that these people are only trying to defend their own personal liability, but it doesn't matter what I say. It only matters what the judge says. And so you can imagine that a judge in this case and all probate judges in the state, they have tremendous power because they alone hold the discretion to decide, is the trustee going to be able to use trust funds or not? And a lot of times what these judges will do, and I don't blame them because it's hard to make these decisions in the beginning, is they'll do what you suggested before, especially if they're also a beneficiary of the trust. And they'll say, I'm not going to decide this issue right now. We'll decide it at the end. And if I decide that the trustee shouldn't have used trust money, then we'll just offset some of those fees out of their share of the trust. And so they table the issue is what they do. I can stop sharing now. I mean, this is... Uh... Uh, the first hearing will be October. Uh, I think the press will be writing about this. Uh, um, who knows what happens with it? Uh, these families, they dig in their heels sometimes on both sides, and these cases go quite far. Uh, but we can talk about it as as the case develops. Uh, appreciate your uh, over, uh, looking over the trust, di dissecting the trust. That's kind of your thing. And um, what, just if you were to be the person in Steve Pacini's position, you know, what What? What are you thinking right now? I think an attorney in Puccini's uh, shoes would kind of, you know, encapsulate this as, well, this is just much, much ado about nothing. You know, there's, everybody's getting upset, but, you know, there was delays, there was complications. We had some problems with the administration. It's just taking more time than we like, but everything's on track. Don't worry about it. We're going to get this done. So when uh, the trustees file their opposition to this petition, which I'm sure they will, we should sit down and, and look at it and kind of see, you know, how close to the mark I am in terms of what I'm saying. But really, it seems like a lot of this could be taken care of by just giving Senator Feinstein what she wants. And it, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal if I were on the trustee side. At least that's what I would be saying. All right. Well, as things develop, we'll uh, come back and uh, update uh, uh, the video on uh, how things are going. Albertson and Davidson is here to help you fight for your inheritance. Check out aldavlaw.com for our complete library of helpful legal videos and articles from your favorite California trust and will litigation law firm, Albertson & Davidson, LLP.